a Democratic governor, a great governor, Governor Hickenlooper. So that wasn't a pickup, uh, but it is a Democratic member there. Tim Walls in Minnesota, our colleague, again, uh, winning in, uh, in Minnesota. So for us, just seeing that uh, the extraordinary leadership of these members going into governor's offices, seeing the increased number of de Democratic governorships, it was a great night for the American people. Uh, we won from the, uh, because from the beginning, we focused on health care. Two years ago today, the day after the election, not the same date, but the same day after the election, everyone came together and said, uh, we see the urgency, we want to take responsibility, and that gave us opportunity to protect the Affordable Care Act. That was so essential to the health and financial security of America's working families, and we knew it would be a target of the Trump administration. So just for you know that by that Sunday, we had mobilized many of the groups outside. They were self-mobilized as well. But we all came together, depending on where, despite where we might be on the spectrum on other issues, to say this was our focus. We made a plan to launch our campaign on the weekend of Martin Luther King Day, you know when that is, in January, and we did. After the president's inauguration, as you know, something historic happened in our country, the Women's March, and much of that was about health care, women's reproductive health, <coughs> excuse me, health care, the beat goes on. Over the course of that next year and a half, working with the outside groups, and they deserve a great deal of credit, <coughs> and I'm proud of our democratic unity uh, in the Congress of the United States and our inside maneuvering. That unity was essential to the clarity of our message and our differentiation uh, from the Republicans on that subject. But working together, voting together, we were able to make our case. The outside groups, and we participated in some of this, but the outside groups had 10,000 events across the country speaking out about the risk that was involved in Republican policy in terms of uh, health care in our country. Their assaults on Medicare and Medicaid, their assaults on the, uh, uh, the benefit of a pre-existing medical condition uh, being uh, taken away, all of that, so much more. Uh, the issue about the cost of prescription drugs, all of those issues by groups, coalitions, HCAM, Protect Our Care, little lobbyists, advocacy groups of of uh, patient advocacy groups across the country, labor unions, veterans, the list goes on and on of so many people who were involved in that. Leading up to this being on the ballot, and when people, some of you have said to me, how did this emerge as the issue in the campaign? My answer is, we made our own environment because we knew how important Healthcare is not only to the good health of families, but to the financial well-being of their families. Healthcare cost being such a, a major um, assault on their economic security. It was, uh, it, it was, and when we put together our for the people agenda, our first priority was to lower the healthcare cost by um, lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Leader Mitch McConnell went forth and really admitted that social, Medicare and Medicaid and some aspects of Social Security uh, disability benefits were on the chopping block. The president pulled his punch when it came time uh, to lowering the cost of prescription drugs by enabling the secretary to negotiate for that. So this is very important. That was uh, for the people, lower health care costs, bigger paychecks by building the infrastructure of America, integrity in government uh, by reducing the role of big dark money in the political spectrum. That was our agenda. P our candidates ran with it. But health care, health care, health care in every household in America is an important issue. The man whose office I occupy now, Speaker Tip O'Neill, he said all politics is local. When it comes to health care, all politics is personal. And so, again, we made our own environment. While the GOP tried relentlessly to distract and divide, uh, our, our candidates kept their focus 
on that subject. And when I say our candidates, our candidates for re-election as well. Uh, voters uh, delivered a resounding verdict against congressional Republicans' attacks on Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act and people with pre-existing conditions in districts everywhere in America. They went in a new, what new direction? A house that will, now they want a new direction, a house that will work to make progress in the lives of America's families and seniors. Democrats pledge, again, a new majority hour for the people agenda, lower health care costs, lower prescription drugs, bigger paychecks, building the infrastructure, uh, clean up corruption to make America work for the American in people's interest, not the special interest. Yesterday's election was not only a vote to prote uh, protect America's health care, it was a vote to restore the health of our democracy the health of our democracy. Under the Constitution, I'm proud that the legislative branch is the Article I, the first branch of government, the legislative branch. Right after that beautiful preamble stating our purpose, Article I, the legislative branch. There as a co-equal branch of the other branches of government and a check and balance on other branches of government. The American people have put, want to put an end to unchecked GOP control of Washington, restoring, again, the checks and balances envisioned by our founders. That's a responsibility we have when we take that oath to protect and defend the Constitution. And we, as Democrats, are here to strengthen the institution in which we serve and not to have it be a rubber stamp for President Trump. House Democrats will honor our responsibility to the Constitution, as I said, have a concert, how we will open, how we will do things. We will open the Congress with a rule uh, that will ins insist upon openness and transparency so that the American people can see the impact of public policy on their lives. Putting an end to what the Republicans did with their tax scam in the dark of night with the speed of light, no hearings on a bill that would have trillions of dollars of impact on our economy, that's over. We will strive in that openness with American people as our partners because they will see the impact of legislation on their lives. We will strive for bipartisanship. We believe that we have a responsibility to seek common ground where we can. Where we cannot, we must stand our ground, but we must try. And so by part openness and transparency, accountability, bipartisanship, a very important part of how we will go forward. We believe that's a responsibility we have to honor the vision of our founders. Uh, they gave us, a, in their declaration, a call for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How beautiful. But they also gave us guidance on how to achieve that. E pluribus unum, from many one. They couldn't imagine how many we would be come or how different we would be from each other, but they knew that we had to strive for oneness, recognizing that this is a marketplace of ideas. Uh, we have different views on the role of government, and that's a healthy debate for the American people to witness and for us to have. Uh, we do so with confidence in our values and our uh, proposals, but also with humility to listen and hear what others may have to say. And so that will be the kind of Congress that we have, one, again, that honors the guidance of the pluribus uh, of Pluribus Unum. Last night, I had a conversation with President Trump about how we could work together. One of the issues that came up was part of our For the People agenda, building the infrastructure of America, and I hope uh, that we can achieve that. He talked about it during his campaign and really didn't come through with it in his first two years in office, but that issue has not been a partisan issue in the Congress of the United States. Over the years, we've been able to work together regionally, bipartisan, across the aisle, across the Capitol, and down Pennsylvania Avenue. Hope that we can do that because we want to create jobs from sea to shining sea, creating good paying jobs, uh, whether it's about uh, surface transportation, water systems. My colleague, Congresswoman Eshi, was here at Champion on broadband, always on high speed broadband across America to end the digital divide, especially into rural areas as well as urban areas. 
and then schools, housing, and the rest. Those jobs, those, uh, those initiatives will create good paying jobs, will also generate other economic growth in their regions. So we, we hopefully we can work in a bipartisan way in that way. Uh, the other issue that we could hopefully work on is lowering the cost of prescription drugs. And that is something the president has talked about. Uh, we had it in our 6 for 06 12 years ago when we won the House. All, all five of those six became law. The one we couldn't get 60 votes in the Senate for was enabling the secretary to negotiate for lower prescription drug prices. We hope to get that done now because that is a big impact on America's family's budget. And then the third really caffeinating issue for us is integrity in government to reduce the role of dark special interest money. And I commend all of our candidates for their commitment to the health care agenda, to the better, uh, bigger paycheck agenda, uh, and also uh, to the good government agenda. They have written letters saying that they want HR1, which is our better deal for America's democracy, uh, to be something they vote on. But I say to them, when you come here, you will have an impact on what that legislation is. You may want to make some additions uh, or some uh, tweaking. But nonetheless, our newcomers will be part of putting together how the agenda goes forward. And we look forward to that invigoration uh, of the Congress. I also spoke to uh, Mitch, Mc uh, Mitch McConnell, this mo uh, Leader McConnell this morning, and how we could work together, especially on infrastructure. Uh, I did receive a call of congratulations from uh, Speaker Ryan, and I welcomed that. And we discussed how it is to win and how it is not to win in terms of this. So in any event, uh, the um, concern that he was expressing was about for some of his colleagues who would no longer be serving. On that point, I want to make a couple, I want to say something because in winning this election, not only we were on the right side of history, we were on the right side of the future. This is where we have to go. But when we talk about the challenges that we face, we had to jump over gerrymandered lines all over the country. So when we talk about our success, it's about the grassroots operation owning the ground. All of these groups that cared about health care, many of them out there uh, to help uh, elect people who shared their value about lowering health care costs, uh, moving uh, lifetime caps, even annual caps on insur insurance coverage, and certainly restoring uh, the benefit of pre-existing conditions, not being a barrier to coverage. Most importantly, though, the quality of our candidates. They're spectacular from every walk of life, and some of them from a couple of different walks of life. And when they come here, they'll bring their experience, their uh, knowledge, and especially their values to the Congress. We look forward to that. This is no easy feat uh, to win this election. I hear the president attributing to this, that, and the other thing. But when you think of how gerrymandered the country is, how we hope to change that, uh, but uh, nonetheless, how we were able to succeed in this election is a tribute again to the quality of our candidates, uh, the determination of our grassroots uh, folks across the country, and the values that we share with the American people. In terms of working with the president, I, um, uh, I just would say that I worked very uh, productively with President Bush when we had the majority and he had the presidency. We passed one of the biggest uh, energy bills in the history of our country. Uh, we passed one of the biggest uh, uh, tax bills in terms of stimulus um, for low-income people as well as middle-income people uh, in his presidency. And the list goes on. PEPFAR. He wanted PEPFAR. We want it big. And, and there's so many issues that we work together, even though I vehemently opposed him in the war in Iraq. But the point is, is that we worked together. The president said, I'll wait for them to send me something. Well, we have ideas, and uh, we can send them something. But the fact is, if we we like to work together so our, our legislation will be bipartisan. We're not going for the lowest common denominator. We're going for the boldest common denominator. Our position will be a consensus within our own party of what we can support, uh, but also welcoming other ideas. 
So we look forward to a, a new kind of a new era in terms of what has happened. It's this past two years, it seemed like a very, very long time in terms of the path that has taken us down. And I think of our founders and their courage, their vision, what they had in mind for us, the Pluvisuma for many one. When I think of the American people and how beautifully diverse we are and how uh, newcomers to our country have constantly reinvigorated America, when I think of our beautiful planet, uh, planet and, of course, our own country, God's gift to us and how it has been neglected uh, and degraded in this past couple of years, uh, I think that there's plenty of opportunity for us to match our legislation with the rhetoric uh, that, we are, that we are hearing. It might surprise you to know that the president I quoted the most on the campaign trail, who would you think? Ronald Reagan. And I'll just, I won't read you the whole quote, but I'll read you just one paragraph. Ronald Reagan said, this is the last speech that I will make as president of the United States, and I want to, it's fitting to leave one final thought and observation about a country which I love. His last speech, that's quite a headliner, right, in your business? Ronald Reagan's last speech. He said, thanks to each new wave of new arrivals to this land of opportunity, we're a nation forever young, forever bursting with energy and new ideas, and always on the cutting edge always leading the world to the next frontier. This quality is vital to our future as a nation. Goes on to say, if we ever close the door to new Americans, our leadership in the world would soon be lost. If we ever close the door, our leadership would soon be lost. So in that respect for the vision of our founders, the diversity of our country, the beauty of our land, the values in our constitution first and foremost, uh, we think there's an opportunity to work together. One sign of good faith on the part of the president to work together was for, for them to withdraw uh, their assault on the pre-existing condition benefit, which uh, the Republican attorneys general across the country have put forth and which this administration has said they will define the law of the land. They'll join in that lawsuit. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. So we think, as, again, as a sign of good faith and in keeping with what they're saying on the campaign trail, prove it, withdraw the lawsuit. So that would be one place that we could start. In any event, next week we look forward to welcoming our new class of freshmen. Uh, we will uh, uh, celebrate their diversity, the freshness of their thinking, and the rest and they will immediately be incorporated into our building of consensus on how we go forward in a very open, transparent, bipartisan, unifying Congress. Any questions? Yes, sir, because I, I didn't review last night. Uh, the, uh, the president uh, warned in a press conference about democratic investigation uh, into the White House and Trump administration. He uh, said that the halt government. He also said that uh, the tax returns wouldn't be released necessarily because they have a continuous audit. So my question is, are you concerned about Democratic overreach in any way in your investigations? And two, how far are you willing to take the push to get the president's tax returns in this new Democratic majority? The president also said this was a good day for Republicans. So let's put that in perspective as well. The, um, the, we have a, a constitutional responsibility to have oversight. That's the balance of power. Uh, I'm an appropriator. It was one of the places I was forged in the Congress on the Appropriations Committee as well as on the Intelligence Committee. Both places uh, were, whose hallmarks were bipartisanship, N nothing. We could always lift our own devices, find our solutions. That, of course, has changed now when the poison pills rain down from one high. Uh, but in appropriations and in all and many of the other committee, all of the other committees, we have a responsibility to, for oversight. And hopefully, in the course of of uh, asking for information, we can just make the request, and the information will come in. We're concerned about what's happening at EPA, for example, to degrading of the air we breathe and the water we drink, despite what the president said today. So that's one, only one example. I don't think we'll have any scattershot uh, freelancing in terms of this. We will have a responsibility to honor our 
oversight responsibilities, and that's the path that we will go down. We're again trying to unify our country. Now, that's it. That, look, when our committees, I'm a big believer in the committee system, always have been, our committees will make their decisions and make their recommendations uh, to the caucus. But you can be sure of one thing. When we go down any of these paths, we'll know what we're doing and we'll do it right. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. There's going to be a historic number of women in Congress, 30 of them. I want to know, how are they going to change the institution? And also, with you and your leadership team staying at the top, how are they going to have room to advance? Well, I have always advanced uh, members uh, into the leadership. They have to decide they want to run. Many people like making their mark in their committees, and that's a decision they have to make. But to your first part of your question, what I, uh, some people have said to me, and I, I appreciate your question, some people have said to me, now that we have more women coming in, well, we have more emphasis on things like child care and this or that. We have a big emphasis on that, and we need to make it stronger in the majority. But that's across the board in our, in our caucus. I don't want women only to be, you know, as important as that is, and it's vitally important to women's uh, role in the workplace, I want women to not just be talking about those issues, because we view every issue as a women's issue. We believe the national security of our country is a women's issue. The economic security uh, of our country. National security, economic security, issues that relate to energy and the rest. They're women's issues. So my, uh, what I have always tried to do with everyone here is to, if they're interested and try to uh, introduce them to be interested, is to have a security credential, whether it's on uh, armed services, intelligence, foreign affairs, veterans affairs, uh, Mr. Cummings Committee of Government Oversight, uh, judiciary and uh, fighting terrorism, oh, to have a, a security credential. I think this is very important uh, for the face of security in our country, not to just be the men who've been doing it all along, with all due respect to their terrific leadership, but for women to take uh, command and have standing on those issues, and many of our new members coming in have bring standing with them already. Some do, some do not. Uh, I do think that um, on, in terms of the economy and our committees, uh, we have um, Maxine Waters at Financial Services, so there's a, already uh, a record of high leadership on issues that relate uh, to uh, the economic security of our country. Uh, we have, I think, four new women members on the uh, Ways and Means Committee this, just this past year. I mean, usually there'd be one, or maybe one or two, but an infusion of four more uh, new members. So again, in all these issues, I want women to take ownership of uh, uh, what would be traditionally not uh, as highly visible roles for them. And that's one of the ways that they will uh, change the Congress. Uh, so that when people, when the White House or the administration, whatever administration is, has to report to leadership in the Congress at any level about the safety of our country. They'll be talking to the full diversity of our country, our women, people of color, LGBTQ, and uh, I think that's a very positive thing uh, because people in the public will see people who share their values, their experience, their concern, making decisions about the safety and security of our country. Have said that they're not sure they can support you in the House. You were the first woman Speaker of the House. Are you confident that you are going to be the next Speaker of the House? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. What I say to those women, congratulations on your election. Welcome. I've answered that government. question. I was, let me just say this in one sentence. I heard the President say, I deserve to be the Speaker. I don't think anybody deserves anything. It's not about what you have done, it's what you can do. What you have done in the past speaks to your credentials, but it's about what you can do. And I think I'm the best person to go forward uh, to 
unify, uh, to negotiate. I'm, I'm, I'm a good negotiator, as, as anyone can see in terms of how we have won every negotiation uh, so far. The only one we didn't win, because it wasn't a negotiation, was the uh, GOP tax scam, the dark of night and the speed of light, as I said earlier. So I think that my case is about uh, being the best person for how we go forward, and I'm not going to answer any more questions on that subject. We have important, we saw something this morning that challenges the conscience of our country. We saw something this morning uh, that shows a differentiation in uh, respect for the diversity of our country. We have to try to bridge that gap to bring people together and that I think I can do a good job at that but I'm not going to spend any, I'd rather answer questions about policy and the rest and this, the, the record will speak for itself. Yes ma'am. The president said this morning he made clear that if Democrats launch investigations that any hopes for bipartisanship is off. Do you have any concerns that these investigations could jeopardize your opportunities to legislate? We do not intend to uh, abandon or relinquish our responsibility as Article One, the first branch of government, and our responsibilities uh, for accountability, for oversight, and the rest. Uh, th this doesn't mean we go looking for a fight, but it means that if uh, we see a need to go forward, we will. But that will be the work of our committees. Uh, Every committee has oversight responsibility. Congresswoman Ash is on energy and commerce, and that's a big oversight committee, as some of you probably are aware. Uh, but specifically to some of the concerns that the president may have, uh, the Judiciary Committee, the Intelligence Committee, the uh, um, Oversight Committee, the, um, well, there are a number of committees, but f depending on how we go down the path, the uh, Financial Services Committee, did I say intelligence? Oh, Homeland Security Committee. Because, of, of course, we are shamed as a nation by a policy that takes babies out of the arms of their mothers, uh, that builds tents and all the rest uh, to, uh, to house people that they're sep and their separation of families. So we want to look into that. And we would hope that we could do so by simply having oversight. If, in fact, it requires a subpoena, I hope not, but so be it. Um, in hindsight, um, do you think it was a mistake for Democrats to stay silent on all the heated um, rhetoric from the president and some Republican senators? I mean, the Republicans kept this, the control of the Senate, and some of them ran on this anti-immigrant rhetoric. So are you, in hindsight, you know, maybe thinking that that was a mistake for Democrats to stay silent? No, I do not. I'd say I urged our colleagues not to take the bait on what the president was putting out there. It's a very dangerous issue on the campaign trail because of the misrepresentations that are put out there. Uh, you don't uh, win a fight by fighting that same fight. You win by sticking with the program for the people, lower health care costs, bigger paychecks, cleaner government. That produced a big victory for us in spite of the gerrymandering that the Republicans have done. I have no regret. Speaker McConnell is, is pledging to, again, vote on the border wall and, and border security funding that he claims Democrats um, push, push back on. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I didn't watch his press conference, I don't know exactly what he said, but what I will say is this. One of the biggest um, resources that we have, when I say we, the American people, and we as representatives, is public sentiment. You've heard me say, many of you again and again, Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, practically nothing. And I do believe that one of the reasons that we will be successful in our negotiations is because the people will see the impact of what is being proposed on their lives, on their values, on our country. And so that is, as, look, President Ronald Reagan, President George Herbert Walker Bush, President Clinton, President George W. Bush, President Obama, all valued the contribution of newcomers to our country, with their hope, their determination, their optimism, their courage to make the future better for their families. They're all American traits. And when they come with those values, they make America more American. Other presidents saw that. This president used it as a, 
uh, in fear mongering, I just don't think that's right. But in order to get in a position to fight it, we had to win on the issues that strike right to the financial security of America's working families, and those are our values. Yes, ma'am. Last question. President Trump said that he actually believes there will be less gridlock with the divide of Washington. What gives you any confidence that with Democrats in control you can reach deals on issues that you haven't been able to reach deals on for the past year? Public sentiment, our biggest ally. Uh, the Martin Luther King said legislation, no, he said the ballot, the ballot, the ballot. Legislation, legislation, legislation. Your life, your life, your life. Calling to people's attention clearly that voting was important because what happens legislatively can impact their lives. With our transparency in government, uh, we intend for people to see the impact of legislation on their lives and to weigh in on it. That is our strength. That is our strength. Uh, another person who marched with Dr. King, Walter Ruther, he said the bread box and the ballot box cannot be separated. Decisions made at the negotiating table, successes at the negotiating table will be overturned by what happens in legislative halls. People have to see more clearly the connection to voting policy and their lives uh, so that they will vote and they will have an impact on the public policy. I feel very confident about it. I think uh, Democrats come into this majority with a responsibility not to Democrat. It's not about Democrats or Republicans. It's about the United States of America. It's about the country that Ronald Reagan talked about, that he loved, the president said he loved, that we all love. We have uh, a great uh, obligation to honor the vision of our founders and what they were so courageous in fighting for and so brilliant in presenting to us. We have a responsibility to our men and women in uniform, the sacrifices they and their families have made over time to keep us the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we have a major responsibility to our children and their future because this is all about, elections are all about the future. And I think there might, there needs, there has to be a place where we can find common ground uh, to end a situation in our country, which is that one in five children in America goes to sleep hungry at night. One in five children in America lives in poverty. How could it be in the wealthiest country that ever existed in the history of the world? How do we address that? By lifting up everyone in our society uh, to speak to the uh, bigger paychecks for everyone including lifting up those at the bottom. Uh, it is, uh, uh, the middle class is the backbone of America. Some of us believe that the middle class has a union label on it. Uh, so the more we can do about people making, dis uh, having involvement in the determination of their fate. If I just may say, my, I, I brag about our candidates saying they know their why. They know why they were running. They know what they cared about and to speak to it authoritatively. They knew how to communicate with their constituents and relate to their hopes, dreams, aspirations, and concerns. My why has always been the one in five children who live in poverty uh, because I think it's a, a symptom of something else in our society about everybody not participating in the full prosperity of America. Uh, and when I say that, uh, I say it to um, uh, to say that there are many ways to solve problems, that some of it is direct, some not. Uh, but I do think the American people are, have go good heart. Uh, I respect them, those who vote with us, those who Hi, everyone. I'm Rena Nine, and you've been this. listening to Nancy Pelosi speak after last night's midterms. President Trump also weighed in for the very first time about the election results. The GOP lost the House, but they did make gains in the Senate. Here's what President Trump had to say. And last night, the Republican Party defied history to expand our Senate majority while significantly beating expectations in the House. Of the 11 candidates we campaigned with during the last week, nine won last night. This vigorous campaigning stop, the blue wave that they talked about. I don't know if there ever was such a thing, but could have been. If we didn't do the campaigning, probably there could have been. 
So here's what Congress looks like right now. The Democrats have gained more than two dozen seats in the House. That's bound to mean much more oversight for President Trump and his administration, and their majority may also continue to grow. Some races have yet to be decided. There are also undecided races in the Senate, Florida, Arizona, Mississippi, and Montana. And although we do know Republicans will keep their majority and gain seats there, one of the most controversial races in the country may actually be headed to a runoff. Georgia's Stacey Abrams is trying to become America's first black female governor. She trails her Republican opponent, Brian Kemp, just barely. I want to turn now to James Homan in the Washington Post newsroom. He's a national political correspondent, and he joins me now. Okay, boy, what a night. James, lots to go over. So the president took credit for helping Senate candidates win, but he seemed to sort of downplay the losses in the House. You know, do the results that we got Tuesday night validate his strategy going into midterms? Well, it, the the election was a referendum on President Trump, whether people loved him or hate him. And, you know, a historically high number of people in the CBS exit poll showed that Donald Trump was top of mind. He was the reason they voted either for Republicans or for Democrats. And that was ultimately.